February 2004, I distinctly recall it was 234. Okay. Tom DeVox over working on a project over in the Tapes Building, which is across the street from, across the highway from SP Hall. And you got to go through a tunnel. I think you've all been there before. And then it's about a quarter of a mile down, and there's what's called the manufacturing building. And he was doing some project for Miscavige because he was the one guy who was allowed to leave the hall because he had been appointed in charge of the hall because he'd given so many right answers, I guess. I guess that was the statistic, <laughs> something like that. So in any event, Tom's over there. And I just had this, thi this, this thing with Tom two nights earlier where, you know, he was on threat of SP declare, if anybody listened to me, the first thing he did, he came over and asked me a question. <laughs> I just had that, you know, that back and forth with him. And we had had some more communications about, you know, what do we do here? And it was almost on the verge of, of conspiratorial. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's like you're talking about your uncle who's drooling down his chin in the corner, and you're, you know what I'm saying? You're talking about it, but you can't really, you know what I'm saying? Now, how are we going to deal with pops? But, you know, but, you know, you couldn't go there because if, it, if you got caught doing that, you'd be declared for other. But we're, we're reaching that level where we're, we're sort of having a tacit agreement that something needs to be done about not this scene, but this guy. You know what I'm saying? So I had sort of that bond with Tom. And so Tom's over there. So we all run double time because we all had to go over there. We were summoned over there by uh, Miscavige. We all arrive over at the manufacturing building. The 40 people from international management are all sort of in the semicircle. And on the other side, there's a semicircle of Golden Area production executives. They're in charge of the studios there. And in the middle is Tom. Miscavige comes pulling in with his little entourage of five or six and starts interrogating Tom. And Tom, like, lagged for a second, like thought for a moment before he answered a question. And before he could even look back up, Miscavige was flying towards him with his fists flailing and just started beating the living hell out of Tom right in front of everybody and got him up against a pallet of boxes, as I recall it. It was hitting him in the face and in the stomach and, you know, hitting him to the ground and then hitting him. And... Um, Having been very close to Tom, had a lot of impact on me, and uh, it was really a deciding point for me because it was I, I really I really crossed a bridge right right then and there, and and uh, I knew I was restraining myself because my impulse was to defend him, and I was afraid to do that because I had made a decision early on in my life when I f confronted some life and death situations that if if I had to defend against a psychotic bully I would maim him if I had to in order to protect who needed to be protected so I was there was a lot of restraint going on there because I I decided if I don't remove myself from this environment something really ugly is going to happen and uh, so I watched it, and I restrained myself. And then we all went back up to the SP Hall, except I slipped out to the side into the bushes, went and retrieved my motorcycle, which is a 650 Yamaha, and wheeled it down the hill, got it over by the back gate, and waited in the bushes for the gate to open. And then um, as the car went out, and before the gate closed, I gunned it and headed off down the road. And that's the last I saw of the end base. Now, you, you had been in Scientology at that point for 27 years. Right. You're in upper management. You're used to making big decisions and sort of taking the long view on things. Right. And yet here is this impulse decision. How do you, exp how do you explain that? How that well, I explain it because... I can't imagine a more surrealistic scene going on. Listen, I watched uh, the Jonestown documentary this year for the anniversary of the Jonestown. And I'd never seen that before, even though I'd had to, <laughs> I had to uh, defend allegations that 
you know, linked us up with Jonestown. But I got to tell you something, because quite frankly, there is no parallel. But I'm going to tell you, in those last days of Miscavige, I listened to those tapes of Jim Jones. That's exactly what Miscavige sounds like. You look at those those tapes and footage that they have of Jim Jones, where he's got his own people in assemblies beating up on each other, and you hear the audio on it, and Jim Jones is cackling and giggling. That's what was going on. This guy relished seeing people in pain. This guy relished inflicting pain. It was a sadistic, surrealistic scene that bore no resemblance to what the subject is about, to what the founder was about, to what any of those people that I ever met during my whole 27-year career was about. And I felt I was in a position where I couldn't do anything about it. The only thing I could do was remove myself before I did something ugly that I would regret. So you rode your motorcycle into the night in the desert. Well, high desert. High desert. But it's cold. And I rode it for about 40, 30, 40 miles over to Riverside back through crisscrossing around country roads and um, decided I needed to get a car because was, I was frozen to the bone and um, called for a cab so I could make it out to Ontario Airport. It's the closest place I could rent a car. And I um, gave my motorcycle to this 14-year-old kid that was eyeing it, and his dad was there, and I told his dad, I know, it. <laughs> I know this doesn't make any sense, but this is my bike, and I don't need it no more. And your kid loves it, so take the bike. And the cab, you know, he was kind of like, all right, and I, Cab came, I just left. Got a got a uh, rental car, got a fifth of uh, Jose Cuervo, and drove up the coast. Okay. What happened? What happened next? <laughs> um, I drank a bottle. I drank. Okay, Tom. I got a rental car, and I drove up the coast, and I drank a fifth of Jose Cuervo. And I'm a guy I hadn't drank for eight years, maybe. And even then it was once, <laughs> since 10 years earlier. So you can imagine the effect that uh, that had. But um, I did still have my cell phone and my wife called me and she uh, caught me in the midst of all this. And I told her in a nutshell, because she was down at Clearwater. She was now the RTC representative at Clearwater, mm -hmm. right here at the Fort Harrison. And she said, um, you know, I told her, I, I'm just never ever going back. I said, that place is whack. And I ain't ever going back. And she said, okay, well, what about me? And I said, that's a good question. Let me think about that. Because she was a very nice person. Never did anything bad to me. Was always understanding, always loving. Problem is, we were married for 14 years, and I probably had spent two years with her. Because that was another penchant of... Uh, miscavige was to break up people's marriages, you know, if, if not officially, then unofficially. Keep people separated all the time so they wouldn't create bonds, I think, was the real intention behind that. But in either event, I said, she said, will you call me tomorrow? I said, yeah, because I was pretty incoherent. So um, I, I took off and I, and I was driving through the Santa Barbara Mountains. And I really grappled with this because uh, it was really tough, you know. Because on the one hand, I never was ever, ever going back. And on the other hand, she never did a single nasty thing to me and was always very loving and understanding, you know what I'm saying? So it was a real unresolvable conundrum. So I turned to Jose Cuervo, drank the rest of the fifth, was driving off on a country road. Next thing I knew, I woke up in a, in a um, ditch in a, in a pasture and tried to open the door, and it would only open two inches because there was a telephone pole looking right at me. So I realized right then and there, I probably missed death by about four inches. Um, in any event, that's how that evening ended. Okay.